Okay, we're on page five, according to my n number anyway, and uh, Stephen and Paul. Now, would you just circle Stephen and put a line up on top and just, just so that we can tie this together. What you have in Stephen, who's the first martyr of the church, he's fulfilling his divine must. He's got a passion. He has conviction. He knows what he's called, and that's the end of his calling. In many ways, it's the highest, it's the highest calling. Um, Stephen and Paul, as we go through the life of Paul, there's going to be key individuals in his life that will help him on the journey. And I'm no doubt you have them in your life, and you'll have maybe new ones coming into your life. Stephen was the first key guy for Paul, but he, it, it's like before Paul got saved. And you see I have there in that paragraph, Stephen had a great impact on the life of Paul. I just want to read this and get it on tape. Uh, the contrast between the religious life of Paul and the new life seen in Stephen is striking. While the immediate battle seems lost at his stoning, in reality, Stephen's death released great grace and life that would impact many for generations. The brightness and sharpness of Stephen's life and the prophetic sword were needed to pierce and break through the strength of religious bondage and deception in Paul. The holy seed that went into the ground would bear much fruit. Would you write this scripture down? John 12, verse 24. His seed won't become an oak <laughs> in the sense of growing naturally, but it was a seed so powerful. God charges some men like Stephen, and then I also have there John the Baptist, uh, they're, they're launched suddenly for a short time to stun a generation. The thing I like to see when I look at Stephen or John the Baptist, they're like a shock treatment to the people of God, and they just stun that generation. Others will be years in the making, like Paul. Both are needed and essential. Now, I just summarized there the three streams of thought in Jerusalem at the time of Stephen and Paul. You had the Jews of both the Pharisaical party and also right there the Sadducee party. These are the resistors to Jesus Christ and to Christianity. Uh, the Pharisaical party, you have men like Gamaliel, Paul. They're intensely religious. They absolutely love the law. Would you write off to... To, by the word their law, they're totally into temple worship. They love the temple. They love the ongoing sacrifices in the temple. Um, that's the one stream. The next stream is the Hebrew Christian church. These are born-again people. They're all Jewish. Uh, they're led by the apostles, 12 of them. But I'm convinced, and this is really important to take note, the apostles, even Peter, didn't see the full implications of Calvary. Many of them still saw Christianity as like an appendage or extension to Judaism. You'll see in the book of Acts in the first chapters, the church lingered, I have it in your notes there, I think, they linger in the portals of the temple. <laughs> uh, they still went to the temple daily. Uh, they're, they're not quite seeing it. This is where Stephen is a shock because prophetically, the young man saw it. And then you have the third stream, the Hellenized saved Jews represented by men like Stephen spoke Greek, separate synagogue. And now Paul comes to Jerusalem from Tarsus and he joins the fight against the new way. Would you write off into your margin a cross-reference that I have, Luke 15, 
the elder brother. Remember the elder brother in Luke 15 in the prodigal story. He's stoic. He's working hard. <laughs> but he doesn't have that intimate relationship with father. And there's just an ang anger there. It, it, it's just religious, traditional bondage. Paul is a member of the Sanhedrin. That would be 71. And he would have been one who debated with Stephen. Now, I did a Life of Stephen here, I think it was this spring. So normally when I do Life of Paul, I almost take a whole hour on, on Stephen, which we don't need to do. For those of you that haven't heard or went through the Life of Stephen, please, you can look at the church website here at Mount Zion. But Stephen is just this incredible template, first martyr. Uh, he gets saved on Pentecost, gets filled with the Holy Ghost, He's all in to the first church. He goes through this incredible four-year process, and now we find him in Acts 6. And I want you to zero in on Acts 6, verse 15, which is a declaration or a statement of a young man who knows he's going to die, but he's in the eye of the storm. He's in, I believe, perfect rest, incredible peace, confidence, authority, and so now he's brought before the Sanhedrin. Paul is there almost beginning to fume. He's so upset with this young man. Stephen would say something like this, the new has come, the old is finished. Paul would say the old is great, the new must die. And again, Paul would basically say Stephen is a blasphemer and this Jesus Christ is a blasphemer. He's crucified on a tree. He's not the blessed of God, the Messiah. He's the cursed of God. And so off in your margin, if you would write uh, just lion in a cage. <laughs> and I want to explain what I mean by that so it will trigger your memory in the future. When I was about 10 years old, I went to Chicago with my family, and I saw uh, at the Lincoln Zoo the big cat exhibition, this magnificent male lion on concrete, bars, totally bored. Was he living? Yeah, he's breathing. Uh, he's eating. He's eliminating. Some of it was still in the corner of the cell when I looked at him. I locked into his face. It was so sad. And, and I realized now in the framework of what I'm trying to bring here concerning the importance of Paul, remember now, man, message, and method. Either the lion was once free and he was captured. And he lives with a painful memory of what could be. I remember in the particular cell of the Lincoln Zoo on the back wall was a mural of the African grasslands where lions were taking out zebra and they were just doing their lion thing, right? Why? Because they're in their habitat. They're fulfilling their instincts. Uh, they're fulfilling why they were born. He's the king of the jungle. Come on. And, and I realize then there's a second statement that's even more damaging. He was born in the zoo, and he thinks that zoo is normal. And Paul, with his apostolic ministry, presented the habitat for our species called Christians or Christianity for the, for the species to flourish and become all that it's meant to be. Uh, Stephen prophetically would see things, I believe, like the new creation. Uh, the new has come, the new covenant. Uh, it's literally a new race. You realize the old Adamic race 
was crucified that day. And there is a new creation. It's like a divine reboot or reset for humanity. And this new creation has at its head the last Adam, Jesus Christ himself, and we're part of that body. Well, Stephen is seeing this. That's why he's able to say things like, God doesn't dwell in temples built with human hands. Those are fighting words to a guy like Paul because he loves that temple, and he loves the sacrifice, and he loves the religious traditions that make null and void the word of God. He is rejoicing in his in his religious way. And so Stephen to Paul is a total threat to his entire way of life. That's why he has to die. We have to eliminate this guy. Stephen is a man that says they're in the spirit. Now we go to page 6. And what you have there in page 6, beginning in Acts 7, verse 1, is just a prophetic a prophetic message for the ages. I'm not sure how much Acts 7 we got into when we did the life of Stephen because I primarily concentrate on Acts 2 through 6, what produced this young guy. But now out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. So what the high priest does in verse 1 is he asks Stephen a question. Are these things so? All right. Stephen begins to speak. Notice what he does in Acts 7. Let's turn there. Acts 7, just follow with me quickly. I'm just going to highlight a few verses from Acts, Acts 7. Um, can some of you remember when we did Life of Stephen, did we get into chapter 7 very much at all? I know I referenced it a bit. Probably don't remember, right? Steve, you got a little short-term memory thing happening here? How are we doing? Praise God. All right, let's go to verse 2. Hear me, brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. All right, as soon as Stephen says that, Paul goes to another level of anger. Why? Because for guys like Paul and temple worship and law, it's almost like they forgot about Abraham. And for them, it's all about Moses. Moses is their hero. See what Stephen does prophetically? He leapfrogs Moses and begins to talk about salvation history starting with Abraham. Now, how will this impact Paul? Well, later on after he's saved and he's establishing the doctrinal truths of justification by faith in the sight of God. In other words, how do you and I get righteous in God's sight? Would you agree with me, please? That's a big deal. We better get that one right. Because if we mess that one up, we're in serious trouble. It's called hell. God rejects. Remember the guy that, just a parable, how'd you get in here? You don't have the right clothes on. And you got to leave, right? Uh, so, where was I? Senior moment. Rocky. Praise God. This is being taped. What was I talking about? Justification by faith. Paul is commissioned apostolically by heaven to set that doctrine into the church for centuries. When Paul illustrates practically, how justification by faith works, who does he go to? Abraham. Romans chapter 4. Abraham. Galatians chapter 3. Where did he first get that? Well, he actually got it, even though he didn't realize it, from Stephen. And so then Paul will say, wow, God never did make people righteous by the law. God always has saved people by grace and faith. And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And so 
Paul is very clear later on. It, to me, this is so stunning, and I hope you can see it. He's so clear on the actual purpose of the law, and it's not what you think. Well, Stephen is there boldly declaring he starts with Abraham, even though he knows it's going to get him killed. He's just so courageous. There's a, a key thing in verse 3 I want to bring out. When he talks about Abraham, and God speaks to Abraham and said, Depart from your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Now, if you see my Bible, I don't know if you can see it, but I got a little square around depart, and I have a square around come into. Uh, if you have New American Standard, that's what I have. I, I like the New American Standard. And that is the story of Abraham, child of God. That is the story of your Christian life of maturing. In order for you to come into all that God has for you, you're going to have to be willing and able to depart from stuff. And it starts from stuff of the flesh. It will go to stuff of the soul. And in the case of Abraham, if you remember, he was even willing to depart from Isaac. The most precious thing in his life in order to come into all that God has for him. That, that, that's just something I see in Acts 7, verse 3. And then basically what Stephen does is he goes through salvation history. He's trying to establish He's trying to establish a pattern. God provided Joseph ultimately to be a deliverer. His brothers were jealous, and the brothers rejected him. God raises up Moses to be a deliverer. He is rejected. And he just continues to go in Acts 7 into this salvation history. And then we come to the conclusion, uh, starting with verse, uh, let's go to verse uh, for time's sake. Um, verse 44, Acts 7, verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. And having received it in their turn, our fathers brought it in with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations whom God... Um, drove out before our fathers until the time of David. Now, they're all tracking with Stephen. Guys like Paul, they know this history as well as Stephen does. But he's, he's, he's setting them up is what he's doing. Verse 47, but it was Solomon who built a house for him. But now he launches into the prophetic, and here's where he gets into trouble. However, verse 48, I can just see Stephen saying that. In, in the portals of the temple, and the sacrifices going on, in front of this religious, legalistic, love Moses, love law, love temple. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. And then he quotes the prophet, I think that's Isaiah, and then it gets to verse 51, his altar call. You men, meaning Paul, are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, always resisting the Holy Spirit. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law... now. Please hear this in the, in the, with the ears of Paul. Paul loves his circumcision. He's being accused of being uncircumcised in heart. He loves the law, and yet you did not keep the law. Verse 54, there's the response. When they heard this, they were cut to the quick. That is the prophetic sword of the Lord lancing the boil of religion that unleashes murder, hate, stoning, and death. And that's what it takes. That's what it took for God to deal and dislodge and get Paul on the path 
that would lead to his encounter of getting born again. It took someone courageous as Stephen. They're cut to the quick. They begin to gnash their teeth. But Stephen, full of the Spirit, looks up into heaven, and he sees Jesus standing. And the heavens are open. You understand Jesus normally sits at the right hand of the Father. He now stands to receive his precious Stephen who's almost like enacting out another kind of Calvary. Death. Death of the innocent for the incredible guilty that are in front of them. And they begin to stone them, brothers and sisters. Incredibly painful. Bones break. Stuff comes out of stuff that shouldn't be coming out. Your bowels begin to open up. You fall to the ground. You're gasping for breath. And out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth is still speaking. I see the Lord. I see the Lord. Paul says, no, that's false. That's not the real God. They stop their ears from hearing this young man. It's like his prophetic death rattle. It's his last confession. I see the Lord. I see the Lord. And as he falls to the ground, he says to Jesus, receive my spirit. And the very last thing out of his mouth, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In your notes there, you see I have under eight, I guess it's D as the mob is stoning Stephen. You see Galatians 2.20? And I have that phrase there, divine life. That's not Stephen really praying. That is Jesus Christ in Stephen, using his mouth, using his heart. Jesus Christ, one more time. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Precious in the sight of the Lord. Write it down right there. Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. Why? Because it releases life. It releases grace. It releases mercy. And, and heaven is looking at this. Angels are looking at this. This is the first martyr. Um, and, and you see in Acts 8, 1 to 3, if you go there, Acts 8, verse 1, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. That, that's very strong language there. It's like he's all in. It's like he's just filled with this religious murder almost hate, zealousness. Um, he's all in, hearty agreement. Paul's first relationship with the church was he persecuted the church. He's the only apostle that had that distinction. After Paul got saved, you know, I, over the years I've read and I've read different things, after Paul got saved, and he would reflect, and he would remember these years, and he would even reflect and remember that day when Stephen was brutally stoned and the garments were laid at his feet. There is no doubt his heart would burst, his eyes would fill with tears. It was always a soft spot, almost like an ache in Paul throughout his entire Christian life. Boy, I, I persecuted the bride. I rejoiced in her death. I don't know. You know what comes to my spirit right now? It's Jacob's got to have a limp. Jacob's got to have a limp. 
um, I believe Paul arguably had one of the strongest souls in the history of man. His mind was razor sharp. His emotions were fierce. His will was like stone. And God had to break that soul. We'll talk more about this tomorrow. And the Lord has to break us. And sometimes we break hard. And we hang on. And we try to save that thing. When God's trying to break it. More on this later tomorrow, but who's more dangerous to the cause of heaven? Judas or Peter? Peter by far. He'll try to prevent Calvary. Judas, he's promoting Calvary. Because Peter needed to be broken. He had good intentions, but they were soulish. Your soul is a very, very subtle enemy to your life in the spirit. Far greater than your flesh. That's pretty obvious. But how do you know when you're in your soul versus your spirit? That's a fine line. That's why it needs to be broken. i I, I got to finish up. Praise God. You're, it's your fault. It's not my fault. Where was I? Help me. Rocky. Lord Jesus. Paul's first relationship with the church was a persecutor. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. Galatians 1, verse 13. Bring this out. You see there, Paul's persecution of the church was a source of pain after conversion. 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 14. You can read it. Now here's Chuck's confession time. Here's what I used to preach years ago. Acts 7. Stephen's death, is that Paul left the scene. He went home, wherever he lived. He's under this massive conviction. And he comes to this realization that his religious way of life could never give him the ability to pray like the prayer he just heard. Forgiveness? After a brutal murder? And so he was under conviction, and the seeds of repentance were planted. The Lord uh, rebuked me one time and said, that you're about it. it might preach good, but you're about as off as you can get. Actually, in reality, what happened is Paul's hatred for Christianity and fear of Christianity went to a whole nother level of persecuting zeal. Verse 2, or verse 1, And on that day a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. This is an amazing thing. You've got to do the math. Do you understand how big the Jerusalem church was at this time? At least 10,000, maybe more. And when this persecution, which is pretty severe, is finished, the whole church is emptied, and you got 12 apostles looking at each other. We need a new church growth program. Quick! What are we going to lead? Persecution. The church is emptied. Look at verse 3. Saul ravaging the church. That's related to like a wolf. Uh, you can think of the term like a, a rabid mad dog. Ravaging the church, he entered house after house, dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison, and he was hardy in them being put to death. Now what it does then is that the rest of Acts 8 zeroes in on Philip, and Paul kind of disappears from the narrative, drops out of sight. And Acts 8 is this wonderful story about Philip, and revival in Samaria, and people getting baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's also a story about Simon the magician who tries to buy the power of God with money, and Peter rebukes him. And then we come to the end of Acts 8, if you'll look at that, when it's kind of, we're talking about Paul, and then we come into verse 1 of Acts 9. Now, Saul still breathing threats, and murder against the disciples of the Lord. 
Church, I want you to keep remembering. Write this in your notes somewhere. Where are we at now? We're on page 7. We're on page 7. Um, he's, that out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Right, Adam? This is what's in Paul's heart. He's alarmed. He's looking at Stephen. Whoa! There must be more like this guy. We got to stamp this thing out. This is a dangerous movement to our way of life, which is temple, law, and Moses. And they had a zeal to establish that righteousness before God. It blinded them. They couldn't see it. And so Paul goes to the high priest and says, listen, give me authority to go to Damascus and keep rooting out this Christianity and stamping it out. And then if you look at the top of page 7, we have here what I call Paul's awesome conversion. Would you write above the word conversion, pattern? Would you also write template? In other words, there's something very important in this conversion experience of Paul. Let me explain why I believe this is so, and then I'll bring it into our modern day scenario. After the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, there are more verses in the New Testament, numerically, devoted to the conversion of Paul than anything else. Obviously, the Holy Spirit is trying to emphasize something. The conversion of Paul is mentioned three times in the New Testament. I want you to think pattern, apostolic conversion, apostolic conversion. You see in the top there, he goes from persecutor to an apostle. Someone who is advocating death to this Christian message now will become the number one apostolic proponent of the true Christian message. Conversion is, write it in your notes please, water into wine, a legitimate, a substantial change that is marked by ultimately a change in lifestyle. Why am I emphasizing this? Because I think we got people in the church who are not saved. They haven't been converted. And that's a dangerous thing. It could translate even into some of our children or grandchildren. And I have grandchildren. And if you have an encounter with the risen, exalted Jesus Christ, can we start here? There's going to be a change. Boy, that wasn't, that's kind of weak. Are we tired or what? There's going to be a change. Did you change, Adam, when you got born again? Look at F.F. Bruce. No single event, apart from the Christ event, has proven to be so determinant for the course of Christianity as the conversion and commission of Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament. He established the foundational doctrines of the church. An 18th century writer, and I have a quote there. This is a really profound statement if you really ponder it carefully. The conversion and apostleship of Paul, when duly considered, in other words, this old-time theologian says, I want you to really think about this. I want you to really look at this guy. I want you to see this zealous, all-in, self-righteous, elder brother, total devotee to Moses' law and temple worship, his pharisaical way of life. It is the pinnacle. (coughs) He's the guy that Jesus is talking about in many ways when What does the publican do? Can't even lift his head, right? And he's just beating his breast. And what is Paul doing in the corner? Thank God I'm not like this reprobate. 
I mean, that's the blindness. That's the blindness of the veil that has dropped over your heart that Moses and the law do. And so here's what this guy says, the conversion and apostleship of Paul, when duly considered, is itself a demonstration sufficient to prove Christianity a divine revelation and true. Only the resurrected Christ, only the power of the grace of God could break through a nut, a religious nut that is as hard as Paul. This is what this guy is saying. Come on, consider this. Wow, wow. And so what you have in Acts 9, 1 to 20, is Paul's conversion. But I want you to begin to look at Acts 9 now, and we'll just briefly touch on it, and we'll pick up our story, because now she, the Pauline seminar picks up some serious steam. Here he is going to Damascus, breathing murder. I love it. You know what heaven says? Heaven looks down. Now, heaven understands Galatians 1.15. Hey, we separated that guy from his mother's womb. Heaven understands the truth of Ephesians 1.4. Hey, he's one of our chosen ones. Hey, we got this whole thing set up. We got this whole thing set up. So Father in heaven, now I don't want to overdramatically present, but Father in heaven look at the Holy Spirit or say to the Holy Spirit, it's time. Go get him. Jesus Go get him. And a brilliant light explodes on that Damascus road. Paul is struck blind. But he sees Christ and he hears Christ and it totally freaks him out. If you look at your notes, when the Lord reveals himself to him, it says, uh, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? You know, I think he answered the question. There was this internal desire to almost know God but it was misguided. It was trying to get fulfilled in law and self strength and outward religious, but it's still, who are you? I am Jesus. Now this totally rattles, and would you write off, you see there, Paul is apprehended by God, verses three and four, Ephesians 1, 4, Galatians 1, 15, and then Philippians 3, 12. Scriptures we've already talked about, they're coming to, to, to fruit. Here, I want you to write, that light reveals this. Number one, the truth about Jesus. He is God. Number two, suddenly Paul realizes his religious way of life is inadequate. Doesn't matter how much zeal you have. Doesn't matter how hard you try. It's just a Tower of Babel trying to reach heaven. He also realizes he was driven to know God. To know God. And in that conversion, this is very important. Would you write this down? Seed thoughts are planted in Paul's heart that will later develop and produce tremendous fruit. So I want to say those four things again. In that revelation, almost like suddenly, the truth about Jesus, his religious life is inadequate, he's driven to know God, and there are seed thoughts planted. And I'll end tonight and leave this with all of us to ponder. Acts 9, verse 5. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. 
and we'll get to verse 6 starting tomorrow. I believe there are two questions that are birthed in true conversion. Here's how you can also say it. Write it down somewhere in your margin. There are two passions that are birthed in true conversion. Um, and if those two passions or two questions are not there, I believe we have an obligation to challenge people who may be thinking or believing that they're saved. These two questions are organic. Uh, they're just spontaneous. When a person gets born again, it, it's literally that. It's a birth. It's a new birth. This is where Paul's coming from in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, where he says, test yourself, examine your heart, and see if you, or don't you realize this? Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test. I'm doing a lousy job of paraphrasing the verse, but you get my point. If Jesus Christ is in me and my spirit is recreated, it comes with two questions, two passions, two desires. Here they are. Number one, who are you, Lord? And now you just began a quest, a search. This is the motivation for your intimacy with Christ, motivation for worship, motivation for seeking God, motivation for wanting to hear God. And then the second question is, Lord, what would you have me do? That is related to your must. Now here's an interesting thing, and I will really finish tonight with this. There's three portions of Scripture that describe the conversion of Paul. Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. If you want to read them tonight, you can do it. But here's what I see in those three portions of Scripture. The question, who are you, Lord, is in all three. The second question, what would you have me do, is only in one. And I'm pondering this one day, years ago, Lord, what, what are you trying to even emphasize here? And here's what I felt I heard the Lord say. Being is more important than doing. Who you are is going to always be more important than what you do for me. And would you write in your notes or put somewhere, and we'll come back to get just an iceberg, just write a triangle and put iceberg in it, and you understand how much of the iceberg is actually underneath the water. Okay, that's your being, that's your intimacy, that's about 90%. Above the water, that's kind of what you're doing. I don't know what you're doing. You're interceding, you're evangelizing, you're prophesying, you're missionary, you're Sunday school teacher, you're a pastor, you're an elder, you're a worship leader. That, that's the do. But being is more important. And out of that being, who are you, Lord? That's why Paul says, and this is a declaration of true conversion. Philippians 3. Are you kidding me? I was following it, a system, for 34 years. Then I met him. And the beauty of him, everything else, is like dung. It's rubbish. And so I press on, and I press on, and I press on to know him. Who are you, Lord? You know what I believe, church? I don't think we'll ever exhaust that question. I think we will spend all eternity discovering the depths of our Lord. And I think it's going to be a pretty exciting journey and discovery. God does want to do it. That's all part of what intimacy. It's to know him. It's to know him. And then out of that intimacy and knowing, that, then the doing flows. The doing flows. 
So let that be a seed in our hearts. Who are you, Lord? I, I find myself praying a lot. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to this more when we talk about Paul's hidden life. He's going to have an incredible hidden life of 12 years. There's going to be a lot that will happen there. But just to have this foundational, and we'll close with this. And Adam, I'm going to have you pray and close it out for us. Or I just want to be your friend. Forget all the other stuff. Lord, I just want to be your friend. Just want to be your friend. Jesus, want to hang out with you. Want to see you. Want to hear you. I want to touch you. I want to be your bride. I want to be your friend. Hey, thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. We went over about 10 minutes. Adam, would you pray and seal this and help us for tonight and get ready for tomorrow? Mm. Amen. Go home, and head a good, go home and get a good rest, and we're going to start sharp at 10, so try to be here by 9.40. And